So in our previous video, we looked at Hofstede's dimen cultural dimensions. And so we're talking about leadership and here in the context of recognizing that individuals, the countries they come from, where they grew up, or the countries they're living in determine the national culture. And we differentiate this from our discussion in our next video about corporate culture, organizational culture. So corporate culture is something that the company can develop and easily change. The national culture, the culture that's developed from a very young age, so think about when you're a child, uh, that is much more ingrained. And so we recognize that as we are leading, as we are managing individuals, they are being influenced by their natural, their national culture. And so this can change then the way we want to manage individuals, the way we want to manage teams. And so what if you have a global team? So what if you have individuals from a number of different cultural backgrounds? So as a manager, one of your roles is to assess the resources in the context of the unique cultures of the individuals who are part of your organization or, or your team. And so this might change the group structure in terms of the cohesiveness, the ability of the group uh, to work together and conformity. How well can you get agreement within your team in terms of the goals and the direction they're going? We also talked in previous videos about how when we look at group behavior, one of the things we look at is status. So within a group or a team, people tend to determine their kind of level within the team. So are you the leader? Are you a, a follower? What is your role? And there tends to be general agreement within the group or team in terms of, of different people's level of status. And then there's an expectation that the people who have a certain level within, the, within that team have a certain level of recognition or, or reward for that. So there's some kind of status symbol attached to that. So if you're the leader, maybe you're the more recognizable face of the team, maybe you're the one who speaks out the most. Uh, so different um, in terms of status symbols. Well, depending on the culture, the national culture of the people who make up your team, there's a different expectations in terms of the status, so who is going to fill what role, and in terms of those status symbols. There's also a difference in terms of the acceptability of social loafing. So you'll recall we talked about social loafing before, which is the idea that, you know, you'll just let somebody else do the work, right? So uh, this team is big, they've got it taken care of, I'm just along for the ride. So that level of social loafing that is acceptable depends based on the national culture of the individuals who make up your team. On top of that, you're going to have challenges with communication, language barriers. We'll talk about the importance of communication uh, in a separate video. But if you are leading a global team, you are leading individuals with different national cultures, then we need to recognize the national culture affects the leadership style that the individuals will respond to. And we need to recognize that a lot of the leadership theories that we've been going over in this course have a North American or Western bias in them. They assume that more individualistic um, component that we've been talking about. So what we do now is we look at the GLOBE study. So there are some general traits that across countries, people tend to value in their leaders. They tend to value individuals who are powerful, who are proactive, who have a vision, who can motivate people and who have sufficient planning skills. So from the GLOBE study, and I'll just refresh you here, uh, we talked about GLOBE very briefly when we introduced the gentleman Robert House. So Robert House, we talked about um, the path goal theory that came from House. Uh, but another contribution he has made to management is that he's the founder of the Global Leadership and Organizational Behavior Effectiveness Research Program, GLOBE. And as part of this program, uh, he visited about 40 different countries and he looked at leadership in 62 different societies. And what he and his team found is that there are traits or behaviors that are more universally accepted 
uh, in our leadership. So a leader who is more trustworthy, honest, intelligent, more positive, okay, more charismatic. So if you recall our previous discussion about types of leaders, we talked about transformational and transitional. And so you can see that transformational is more of an accepted type of leadership. So the, the, the charismatic, the visionary. We're talking about someone who is a win-win problem solver. So where does that come from? The idea of win-win. Right, that's uh, Mary Follett who talked about the idea of win-win. And so there's someone who's more of a team builder, communicator, more decisive. We tend to recognize those traits as being leadership traits, no matter what culture we are from. But there are different leadership profiles uh, that GLOBE has found, and which leadership style is preferred does depend on your national culture. So let's start with the ones that are listed here in black. So those are the preferred leadership styles uh, for more North American or Western cultures. So we like someone who's charismatic, right? Can they inspire and motivate people? And as stated previously, the charismatic leader is recognized as an effective leadership style for most national cultures. Where we disagree in terms of national culture on leadership styles would be the participative. So the degree to which leaders involve others in decision making. So that's going to be that low power versus other cultures might prefer more high power, which is uh, not all the subordinates get to be involved in the decision making. We have much more centralization within our organization. The other part we see in North American cultures is a more humane oriented. That is the degree to which the leader shows compassion and generosity. We want a leader who empathizes with the challenges of the worker and that recognition of a human aspect, right? So in terms of, you know, you're asking me to put in extra hours, well, that impacts my time with my family. And so we want a leader who, who recognizes that, that personal component. So if we look at uh, more the Anglo cultures here, you can see charismatic high, participative high, and we can see that humane oriented is high. So let's look at some of the other leadership styles uh, that might be more common in other cultures. And so we can start with, for example, the um, Confucian Asian societies, and you can see there is high for self-protective. So if we're looking at countries like China, self-protective is a degree to which the leader is self-centered and uses a face-saving approach. So what does this mean? Well, we recognize that the leaders within companies uh, in um, cultures such as that of the Chinese, that the leadership does need to save face. If things don't go well within the organization, uh, then you recognize that their leadership is going to take an approach that is going to maintain their image, maintain the respect that, that people have for them, and so there may be some more in terms of, of blaming uh, and um, deferring some of that um, negative uh, responses to someone within the organization. So we talked before in a previous video where we talked about American Factory, uh, that the documentary from Netflix, where in a more individualist society like North America, we want individual celebration. So praise me for the great things that I do. And in a more collectivist society, we, there's less of that praising of individuals. And often the expectation is not praise, but that um, the relationship may be a bit more negative in terms of you're not doing this right, fix this, you know, this is, a, this is a problem, you need to do something about it. And that's part of that more self-protective leadership image in terms of making sure those on top are portrayed in the most positive light. If we look at some of the leadership styles that are, are recognized or accepted in other countries, we can see it says Germanic Europe. Um, participative is high, charismatic is high, similar to, to the more North American, but also notice that autonomous is high. 
And so autonomous here is the degree to which the leader reflects independent and individualistic leadership. So there's an expectation that the leaders go their own way, do their own thing. Uh, they're not one that's a sheep that follows everybody else, uh, but they stand out and carve their own path. So there is an expectation that leadership uh, be those uniquely independent uh, people who are um, not really going with what might be the standards, might be um, what everyone else is doing, but they're they're charting their own path. And then, oh, it's just going all over the place here. If we look at, there's one more leadership style, we'll point to it here. Uh, in terms of Latin America, you can see it's high for team oriented. And so if we go back, that team oriented is a degree to which the leader can foster a high functioning team. So in individualistic societies, we're a bit more group and a little less team. That is, we'll work with people, but we want the recognition to be individual and we want the assessment of our performance to be individual. If we look at uh, nations that are more team oriented, then the focus is really more not on the individual work, but on the group or teamwork and the assessments, the recognition is for the team. The role of the leader then is to foster a high functioning a team. And so we can see that more team based approach uh, here in terms of of Latin America, for example. So when it comes to the dimensions of culture, we talked about Hofstede's dimensions of culture, and a lot of those are represented here with Globe's dimensions of culture. So they're recognizing that there are differences in natural national culture, whether you are looking at Hofstede or if you're looking at Globe, and Globe's focus then on is then on the different types of leadership needed based on those cultural dimensions. So Globe is expanding on Hofstede's uh, dimensions here. You can see some of them are the same. So for example, uh, power distance, we talked about that before. Uncertainty avoidance, we talked about that with Hofstede. You'll also see the gender egalitarian. So again, is there a difference in terms of how men and women are treated? And you can see here future orientation. So how much should we delay gratification? Are we focused on more short-term, uh, long-term planning? There are some additional components here that we see in the Globe 9 that aren't uh, as fully fleshed out in Hofstede. And that would be uh, in terms of taking collectivism and breaking it down into institutional versus in-group. So how much loyalty is there uh, to the individual versus the team. That's the institutional collectivism. And then there's the in-group collectivism in terms of the loyalty to the company versus family. Okay. The other difference we can see here are the last two, uh, and that is looking at the reward system. So how much should individuals be rewarded for their improvement and excellence? What's the expectation in terms of recognition and rewards? And then we have a humane orientation. Um, how much should individuals be rewarded for being kind, fair, friendly, and generous? So more of the human attributes, humane attributes, uh, as opposed to more performance attributes in terms of how many products did you make? But is there a recognition um, for being part of the team, being um, a contributor in terms of morale, in terms of um, how people feel in terms of safe and, involved and included within the organization? So there are a number of different components that you can see here building on Hofstede. Well, let's think about you and your organization. So what do you see as the role of the organization in developing and sustaining a diverse and inclusive workplace? So your management, you're in charge. We recognize that there's a difference in terms of expectations that people have in terms of leadership and management. There's different things that workers want uh, in terms of how they are involved with the organization. 
And so as you think about those things, if you are in charge of an organization, what would you do to develop and sustain a diverse and inclusive workplace? So if you're working with us in the course, uh, you want to answer that question for part of uh, your uh, participation work. So perhaps as you think about this, I'm just going to go forward a bit. We'll come back in a second. Ooh, where did it go? So possible areas in which your organization uh, can work in order to help sustain a more diverse and inclusive workplace. So we recognize that we want to have a more uh, diverse organization, diverse in terms of different viewpoints in terms of people from different uh, areas, different backgrounds, that creates a more creative society, that creates a more welcoming place and a place that is then more reflective of what our customer, of, of who our customers are as well. So, so how do you do this? Well, we need to ensure that as we are recruiting individuals, that we are, are creating an opportunity for people of all backgrounds and all uh, religions of, of all types and, and beliefs have an opportunity at our organization. So we need to reduce the bias in recruiting. And so having highly structured interviews, coming up with your questions ahead of time, making sure all candidates are asked the same questions or evaluated using the same rubrics. This can help ensure that we are not removing opportunities uh, for having a more diverse workplace, recognizing that even though we would like to have more individuals from different backgrounds, part of our organization, there are legal limits in terms of what kind of questions you can ask, right? So you can't ask someone uh, in an interview if they plan to have children. Um, you may have the best intentions in terms of we're trying to hire a more inclusive and have more female representation within our organization. Uh, but asking those questions um, is, is not appropriate. So we need to avoid the bias in our recruiting, um, making sure everyone has an equal chance. And then how do we encourage more diverse individuals to even apply? Well, we need an organization uh, that is inclusive in terms of how we treat the current employees and customers. So we need to look for opportunities for our employees to have partnerships, relationships with other people within the organization um, who might have different beliefs, different backgrounds from themselves. So opportunities to have more diversified mentoring relationships. And then we need to develop a more inclusive corporate culture. So in our next video, we're going to talk about having a more inclusive corporate culture. But before we do that, let's assess your intercultural sensitivity. So as we look at having a developing and sustaining a more diverse and inclusive workplace, do we have intercultural sensitivity? And so if you're following along with the Pearson Revel um, surveys, um, in the Robbins textbook. So we fill out the survey here uh, that looks at five different dimensions in terms of cultural sensitivity. So the first one is looking at your interaction engagement. So do you get to know people who are of different cultures? And then respect for cultural differences. Do you appreciate different cultures? Do you recognize the differences and do you appreciate in terms of, of learning them and recognize the importance that they have to others? How confident are you in your interactions with people from other national cultures? So are you concerned that you won't say the wrong thing, have the wrong gesture, be misinterpreted? How confident are you when you interact that you will do what is appropriate? So if we think, for example, in North America, how you might hail a cab, well, in Greece, this is seen as giving someone the finger. 
So recognizing that there are differences in cultures and behaviors, things that are appropriate in some cultures, not appropriate in others. How confident are you when you interact uh, that you are doing the right thing? And then do you enjoy interacting with individuals from different cultures? And then lastly, in terms of interaction attentiveness, uh, do you feel that you learn a lot when you interact with individuals from other cultures? So what we're looking at in terms of intercultural sensitivity, you aspire to have higher scores in all of these areas, that you get to know others, that you appreciate there are differences, that you can be confident in those interactions, that you can enjoy those interactions, and that you can learn from them. And so here we have some of the statements from the survey um, just relating to what I've just gone through. 